<clears throat> this theory that when you spin a coin, it should come up 50% heads. I mean, that's 50% 50, 50 heads is what you flip a coin and get, right? And has anybody ever asked you for a margin of error on that 50% when you talk about flipping a coin? Do you ever, do you ever go to a football game when they flip a coin? Like, remember, it's plus or minus 5%. No, you don't. Because so many coins have been flipped for so long, we assume that on a coin flip, the margin of error has shrunk down to essentially zero. So we can pretend that for flipping a coin, it's exactly 50%. Is that okay with you guys? Can you live with that assumption? I think it's a fair assumption. So many coins have been flipped for so many centuries, or at least maybe 100 years or so, that we can assume it's 50% without a plus or minus. Is that fair? Is that a fair assumption to make? I think it's okay. Now, based on that, look at these four different confidence intervals that we have constructed. Do any of them give credence to the fact that maybe flipping a coin and spinning a coin yield different results in the heads or tails that you get? Take a look at them again. Do any of those imply, this is, this is probably one of the most important questions we'll ask today, if not the entire class. Do any of those intervals give a result that says, hey, wait a minute, our initial guess that spinning a coin was the same as flipping a coin might be wrong. Any of them, tell me. All of them but the last one. All of them but the last one, why? They, are, they don't reach 50%. Oh my goodness, look at those intervals. This, these intervals represent, they represent the percentage of time you get heads in the population of spinning coins. Now they're based off the sample, right? But then we put the margin of error, that makes it inferential. So what I'd like to do, let's do this. Let's go over to this board. Let's draw these. Let's draw these things, shall we? I think so, maybe. Okay, let's draw a number line. This, I think this is a good way of kind of visualizing a confidence interval. <laughs> I'll have you doing these. I have an in-class quiz for us to do today, too. We'll do that as well. Here's percentage of heads <coughs> on the number line. Now, we have already have hypothesized that it's 50%, one half. I'll put that in the middle. Five. And then we'll go out maybe by 5% five, five increments, 0 0.55, 0 0.6, 0 0.65, 0 0.7. Then we'll go down, 0.45. <coughs> Four, so forth and so on, 0 0.35, 0 0.3, and so forth. Our hypothesized guess, our hypothesized guess is that it should be 50%. So here's what we're, we're claiming originally. This says that spin <coughs> is equivalent to flip. That's our, and there's no margin of error. It's simply a straight line, straight down. Fair so far? Okay, let's draw the other intervals. Because I think sometimes having a two-dimensional versus one-dimensional look at it will make it kind of like, boom. Margin of error, 2%, goes from 39.5% to 43.5%, right? 39.5% is essentially right about here. It goes up to 43.5%, which is somewhere right about here. Okay. Oh, excuse me. 2% margin of error. <clears throat> Even at the highest end of that interval, what's it still below? It's still below the 50% that we guessed, which means there's a difference. Even in the most extreme value of our interval, <coughs> there's a difference between what we hypothesized and what the data shows. Isn't that interesting? What does a psychologist or a sociologist or a researcher do at this point when they see that difference? This is good, this is good, I like this. It's a tricky question. What do we do now? We had a hypothesis that it was 50%. Our data came back here. What's the next question we ask? Why? I, say it louder. Why? Why is our hypothesis wrong? Why did it come back here? Could this be just goofy, deviant data? Could it be? Is there a chance we just got this randomly goofy, deviant? Of course there is. Not a very good chance, though. You'll see why momentarily. So the answer, the question now is, why did it come out looking like this? So you might redo the study. You might redo the study. Let's grab a different color. 
And the, you did, the, 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 the next study you did had a margin of error of 5%. <coughs> and you'll see why that can fluctuate depending on the study. You'll totally see why that by, by the end of Thursday, you'll know why. Let's graph that one too, shall we? 5% margin of error. What would that one look like? Well, it's centered on 41 and a half, but it goes down to 36 and a half and goes up to 46 and a half. Yes? Down to 36 and a half, which would be somewhere right about here, yeah? And up to about 46 and a half. So maybe you're at Stanford and your friends at Purdue run a similar study and they get this and you email back and forth. And what did your friends at Stanford say? Because you email them because you're like, dudes, 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 this is kind of cool. And they email back and go, dude, dude, dude. What did they got to say? They got closer. Right. They, well, they got close to 50%, but it's still not touching, right? It's still off the 50%, correct? It's still not touching 50%. So they're like, dude, dude, isn't there somebody at LaSalle you know? And you go, yeah, 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 let's have them do the study too. So they do the study, and they come back with a margin of error of 4%. Okay? And theirs goes from 37 to 45. That's right, right between, isn't it? 45 and a half comes up to about here. And they email you back. Dude! Dude! It's still not touching! It's still not touching! Think back to 243. If you keep seeing independent results that say the same thing, and those are in opposition of what your hypothesis was, which one's easier to believe? It's kind of easier to believe this, isn't it? Because you keep seeing independent results. As long as the sampling's done right, and Kathy, I can't emphasize that enough, as long as the sampling's done right, it's easier to believe all of these aren't showing you deviant data, or this particular is showing potentially deviant. You've got to remember, this was a guess, right? This green line was a guess. I asked you, what do you think it is? You didn't do an experiment to figure it out, you just guessed a half. These are actually testable. And then what happens? Chris, hold that question if you don't mind for just one moment. I love it, I love it. Then your friends over at NYU, no slam on NYU, very, very limited budget. Very limited budget, they come back with this. And you'll see why, when you have a very small sample, a very large, as Chris said, a very large interval. They come back with 26 and a half, which is down here somewhere, right? This is a 15% margin of error. There starts down here somewhere and goes up to 56 and a half, which is up to here. And then you may go, dude, dude, we can't conclude anything with ours. Can they? Because they can't conclude anything, right? Because 50% is actually in their interval, so they go, well, I mean, you could be a little unmathematical about it and go, more of the interval was left, but you can't do that statistically. All you know is, you are confident that whatever you're looking for is somewhere in your interval. You can't assign it a likelihood based on where. But, remember what I said? You can be wrong. So, the more you can replicate a study like this, the better a view you get of where the truth actually lies. And then maybe you could look at this and go, yeah, but if they had just done a larger sample, it's possible that margin would have shrunk down to the point where it wouldn't touch that anymore, correct? So what do you do? You, you, you go out and have a group of them do the study independently and see what comes up. This is the, kind of the backbone of the scientific method, right? Test it, go back and retest it, go back and retest, see if all the results say something similar. Chances are one or two are going to be off, but a lot are, and we'll come back to why one or two might be off out of a group. That's the interpretation of a confidence interval. Does that make a little more sense than maybe it did when you walked in here today? Chris, ask me that question, we're going to take our five. Go ahead. Well, it's just, you're basing all this on... 41.5%. Correct! It's, it's going to be a different number. Mm. So. Mm. Did you hear what Christian said? Yeah. I'm basing all of this on the 41.5%, which most likely will not carry from study to study. It will fluctuate a little bit. That's why I brought real data. This is all fictitious on the same 41.5%, Chris. I brought real data where the p hat actually does move. We'll analyze that later. I promise you. Very, very good point. That's a perfect point, actually. You can't just assume it's going to be the same. But for sake of interpretation for right now, that's a perfectly valid assumption to make, if that's okay with you. For now. Soon, it will not I don't be. Understand, I don't understand how they can get the, the, uh, the plus or minus 2% is, is, is probably right. I don't, I don't understand how they can get 5%. That's, that's Hold that thought, because that's what we do have to break. Okay. We're going to get into that percentage and figure out where it comes from. 
And we're going to answer the question about how it ties to 243 and also the sample versus population again. We're, we're right at that cusp. But you're starting to get like glazed donut books. So take, take a walk, get some air, get some water. Because we can't do this on the Smith through this on fresh. You want donuts now? Sorry, I shouldn't have said anything.